All right, Steve Wood, recovered alcoholic. Welcome to the Great Rally Book Study. Um, you know, the one thing that I want to mention is there's plenty of people in this room. If you want to put your name in the chat, if you want to sponsor someone, just put your, you know, mention it in the chat. We want to yeah, have, uh, you know, keep passing this on. Um, I might be using the 12 and 12 a little bit tonight. So, so if you have one, you might want to grab it now. If you don't, it's no big deal. Um, so the thing is, is uh, last time, you know, we got, we journeyed into step three and how it's just a decision and it's a pre, you know, it's, it's just that pre-thought plan prior to action. And I'm, 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 you know, looking at everything in front of me. And that's what I was kind of talking about a minute ago is we want to look at everything in front of us. And when I'm making a decision, you know, say I make a decision to, to get a new, start a new career um or accept a new job i haven't accepted the new job until i take the action to do so but so what would a decision to get a new job look like i would be analyzing the whole everything that goes with it the good the bad you know everything so this is the pre-thought plan prior to action and you know the, you know it's returning our, our will our thinking and our life i mean sorry our, our thinking which is our will and our lives, which is our actions, to the care of God, you know, that will do for us, we can't do for ourselves. You know, God is your own conception of God, God as you understand him. And we we got into instincts last week, and we'll get more into that tonight. We talked about how pride, you know, makes us fear what other people think of us and self-esteem. We're better than others, low self-esteem. I don't think I'm good enough. And for us, you know, the, I think the low self-esteem is the one that's always at people's feet. Um, it's always there in some form or another. You'd be surprised um, when, when I don't think I can do this and that. You know, um, emotional security. We went pretty deeply into that, but we went really deeply into material security and, and, you know, where I mentioned things I haven't mentioned before and how material security is more than just money and cars and this and that. It's healthcare. It's all this other stuff that comes with it. But, you know, we run up over others to get what we want. We get, you know, for our sex relations, we get involved with the wrong people. We make cho wrong choices. You know, we're just, we become dishonest. And with our ambitions, our plans, our goals, our dreams, our ideals get changed because our social security and sex and things are misdirected. So tonight, it's, I like call it more about instincts with the focus being instincts and collision with that being said we're going to go to page 44 the 12 and 12 and we're going to go to the last sentence at the top i'm sorry the last sentence um on that page um it says whenever uh, whenever a, a human being becomes a battleground for instincts there can be no peace but that is not all the danger. Every time a person imposes his instincts unre unreasonably upon others, unhappiness follows. If the pursuit of wealth tramples upon people who happen to be in the way, then anger, jealousy, revenge are likely to be aroused. We talked about that last week. If sex runs riot, there's a similar uproar. Demands made upon other people for too much attention, protection, and love can only invite do, um, domination or revulsion in the, in, in the protectors themselves. Two emotions quite as unhealthy as the demands we evoke them. When an individual's desire for prestige becomes uncontrollable, whether it's in the sewing circle or at the international conference ta table, other people suffer and often revolt. This collision of instincts can produce anything from a cold snub to a blazing rev revolution. And these revulsion, I would say, and in these ways, we are set in conflict not only with ourselves, but other people who have instincts too. That's the thing is we sit there and we know these instincts. And we're like, oh, yeah, I know what my instincts are, but I hate that guy. 
And that's like where we become hypocritical. Because if I'm truly understanding these instincts and living this life, I'm going to develop something called compassion. And that's where I look at the person and I go, I know that pain. That's from instincts. You know, um, it's hard, but, you know, you think about make a list of people that that you see on, on a daily basis that you don't really want to be around. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's the neighbor. And then you ask yourself, why? And the truth is, at the end of the day, because they have instincts. You know, and they did something to you that affected your instincts. That's all about instincts and collision. So that's, some, you know, that paragraph really helps to introduce this instincts and collision. Um, now, the, the, you know, the book's going to compare tonight, you know, us to an actor. And before I do that, actually, I fell in love with this poem years ago by Charles C. Finn. And it's called, Please Hear What I Am Not. And this is the short version of it. You can look it up online and read the whole version. But um, I read this years ago. It says, don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the face I wear. I wear a mask, a thousand masks. Masks I'm afraid to take off. None of them is me. Pretending is my second nature. I give you the impression that I am I am secure, that all is sunny. That confidence is my name and coolness is my game. That I am calm, in command, and that I need no one. But don't don't believe me and don't be fooled. My surface may seem smooth, but my my surface is my mask, ever changing, ever concealing. Beneath it lies confusion, fear, and aloneness. But I hide this. I don't want anybody to know about it. I panic at the thought of my weaknesses being exposed. That's why I frantically create a mask to, to hide behind, a nonchalant, sophisticated facade to help me pretend, to shield me from the, the glance of the one who, that knows. So I play a game, a desperate pretending game, a facade of a parade of masks. My, short, my life is only a front. And I read that. It just blew my mind because I like the concept of people, you know, wearing masks, you know. Um, and one of my friends told me years ago, he was a spiritual guide, he says, you know, um, you know, like, what do you gain from, it's not about what you gain from knowing you wear a mask, it's what do you gain from removing it? You know, it's pretty deep. So we're on page 60 of the big book, and we read this sentence last week to get ourselves into instincts or to look at it again real quick. It says, the first requirement is to be convinced that any life on self-work or how they be a success. That's not a small requirement because we're driven by self-will. <laughs> um, self-will, again, is our unconscious devotion to our social security and sex sexual needs, our, sec our, our misdirected instincts which we talked about last week, how those can be used properly. You know, the book also mentions, calls them simply self or exact names are wrongs or defects of character. Um, the, let's look at what it says next. It says, on th that basis, now, and what's the basis? Living on misdirected instincts, living on pride, living on self, the high self-esteem especially. See, some of these instincts, you don't have every second because if I have a mind, if, if I have a if I have a low self-esteem personality, then I'm always gonna feel like I'm not good enough. And that's gonna affect all the other instincts when, when I come into contact with people, especially in the social, right? But if I have a high self-esteem personality, I'm better than everybody. But I probably live in more fear than the low self-esteem person. But on that basis, we're always in almost always in collision. There's that word again, with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. And that's the thing is, I mean, look at your life. How many collisions do you have on a daily basis? How many collisions do you have with others? How many conflicts do you have, even in good moments? Can you have a, can you be around people and just savor the moment and not even worry about what that person might be thinking? You know, but we have clashes. Mr. Instinct is why we are always in collision with something or somebody. So back to the book says, most try to live by self uh, propulsion. So a propeller 
you know, like on an airplane or a boat, it, you know, it, it spins. It's moving, you know, it's, it enables to push something forward, wherever it's attached to it, pulls forward. So look, we're going to look at it more like a boat. So like a boat has a captain. All he's doing is steering the boat, right? But the driving force of the boat is the propeller. It gives, you know, so it gives the boat that strength to move against hard water and stuff like that, right? Now, some uh, or many are unaware it's the power that makes the boat, you know, plow through the water at great speed. Why? How come they don't know? Because they cannot see it. They cannot see the driving force, you know, of the boat is the propeller because the propeller is underneath the boat. It's underneath the water. It's hidden, tucked away. You know, it's, no one can see it. It's, it's the, their drive, the driving force of the boat is hidden away. What's driving you? What's what? What's the driving force of your life? What's always pushing you forward? You know. So for some of that, you might just look at your your your, your um a, a material secure your pocketbook, and yeah, and you go, wow. No wonder I'm always in fear. That's my main thing. Is I'm always occupied with money and this and that. But the average person, I mean, they're never going to know what's pushing them forward. You know. You know, um, because it's hidden. It's in what's hidden is their misdirected instincts, you know, that makes them plow through people. You know, they live on this self-propulsion, these instincts. They they don't even they don't even have a they're not, well completely unaware. If I'm unaware of something, it's you know, it's continuing to happen. Right? So living on self-propulsion instincts. I fail to see its attempt to create happiness. You know, I, it, I don't see it. I, 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 it, I, I don't see, you know, any attempt to create happiness. In fact, the, it often creates the exact opposite, chaos rather than peace, anger rather than calmness, resentment rather than compassion, you know, fear rather than courage. I'm more occupied with that. The harms rather than love. You see why people, you know, say their best thinking got them here. You know, you hear that a lot. The social instincts, I said last week, is our interactions with others and ourselves. Society, right? Our network. So what's the goal of social instincts if used correctly? It's called companionship, right? That's the sense of fellowship and togetherness. You could also call it community, right, with others. and. It's one of the reasons why people get married or seek like-minded friends. It's a sense of, of connection. So it's connection with other people. So if, if social instincts are misused, then the opposite of companionship occurs. We think we're better than others. We worry what people think of us. We, we want to be recognized at all times. I'm better than other people. Basically, we resent others and push people, push them away from us. You know, how many times you know, many times we harm people in that, that realm. How many times does that happen to you? We're living on self-propulsion. Let's see what it says. Now I get some cool stuff here. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. None of us want to run the whole show, right? Is is forever trying to arrange the light, the ballet, the, the, ballet, the, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. Interesting. So what does an actor do? What is what is an actor? They play a part assigned to them. They play a character, right? And they prepare for that role of a character by following a script. So there's a different name for the person that runs the whole show, that arranges the lights, the ballet scenery. That person is called the director. He's the one in control. He's the one that's in charge. The problem is our good actor here, he believes he's also the director, even though there's a director off to the side. I mean, he believes he's in control of this thing. Now, if there's a director and an actor, if our director, if our actor thinks he's a director, do you think he might butt heads with the with the real director or other people around it? Instincts in collision? You know, here's how much control this guy wants, right? If only his arrangements would stay put. If only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. So this guy 
whoever it is, believes, you know, they live in this delusion that if everything stays perfect, if people just do everything he wants, say what he wants to hear, pat him on the back, everything's going to be great. You know, but, you know, I don't want to break the news of this actor guy, but it doesn't work that way. You know, from, you know, for, you know, the thing about it is, think about this for a second. For many, happiness is determined by what others think, what what we think of think of others, you know, should do what we think others should do, and and of course, you know, do it right, you know, and if that fails, if people fail to do as we want, what happens? We get resentful. What if I'm already driven by high self esteem? What if I'm already think I'm better than others? And and my happiness is determined on this these people doing what I want. Talk about an explosion, right? So let's look more at our friend's insane logic. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased, right? Life would be wonderful. So if he's happy, everybody will be happy, right? Do you ever believe that? You know. I know guys that said so much to their wives and they're married. You know, you know, I, I I didn't even see I did that because I was completely unaware. Becoming aware, you know, of that is the beginning of an awakening. You know, um, and trying. You know, notice he says the word trying. What's another word for trying? Attempting. <clears throat> so, in attempting. To make these arrangements are after maybe sometimes quite virtuous so he, he's attempting he's pushing it forward he's going to push his agenda so he, he you know is attempting to make to push his agenda we'll say our actor may be sometimes quite virtuous he may be kind considerate patient generous modest even self-sacrificing but he puts on a good front charming person right but look at this. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But with most humans, he's likely to have varied traits. Another word for trait is character, like the actor plays a character, right? Plays dif different characters, a character actor. How many characters did you did you play? Like I said at the beginning, how many masks did you wear? You know, how many, like uh, Mark Houston says, how many stage characters do you have? So here's here's a character I played, you know, or the masks I wore. When someone met me, I went out of my way to automatically be like, "What are you doing?" Right? I would be kind, modest, not sacrificing. I would talk to them like they're a little child, right? But that was part of my game. That was my hustle. But as soon as I got to know you, you would see that I'm mean, egotistical, self selfish, and dishonest. What drove me? To be kind, considerate, modest, self-sacrificing, my social and security instincts. I mean, I, I wasn't a nice person. I wanted something from from you. I would see what I wanted right away. I wanted so my thing was out of fear. I had to have you trust me. And when I didn't get get what I wanted, you would see the real me. You would see that I was angry, mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But I was not aware of that because I was blinded by these misdirected instincts. I was, you know, I was aware that I was kind, considerate, and self-sacrificing because that was the, the role I played. But completely unaware that I was mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. Let's see what let's see what happens. What usually happens is the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat him right. So you know, we say. Why does everyone else get the, get all the breaks? That's what I used to say. Why does everyone else get all the breaks? Everything happens. Poor me. Low self-esteem. So in resolve that, we become the victim. You know, we are the innocent victims of wrongdoings of others. So we blame. It's in our nature to blame other people. Just, I was told years ago, and I got kind of offended with someone said it too. They said there's no recovery in being a victim. You can't be a victim and be in recovery. You know, I mean, be recovered. And I went, whoa. 
And now it makes complete sense. Let's see how our friend does with this victim mindset. He decides to exert himself more because of his instincts. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, just a little at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. Hmm. He becomes angry, indigenous, self-pity. You know, you get to that level, of, you know, how could they do this to me? Angry at them. And then self-pity at angry at ourselves. We get angry at so many people, there's no one left to resent. Usually when we're all alone, because we pushed everyone else away, you know, that's just what we do. Um, sadly, but it's true. 100%, 110%. Um, so now he's, you know, this actor guy is, he's, re, you know, he's resentful, meaning his instincts are hurt or they're threatened. So he needs to satisfy those instincts. And we satisfy the instincts by harming other people. Or my pride to feel better, or my self esteem to feel better. Because what is our basic trouble? He's not really a self seeker, even when trying to be kind. So, self seeking, so if self is tending mostly to my own needs, with low or no thought of others, self-seeking is pursuing my needs. Another word for that is harm. So I'm satisfying those, making my instincts feel better. My grandpa used to say, purring the kitten, he would say. You know, we just want to feel better. You know, I was, you know, it was so driven by instincts that I harmed people even, you know, when I tried to be kind. Think about that, what he's saying there. He goes, he says, is he not really a so is he not really harming people even when trying to be kind? Is what they're saying there. Is he not back to the book? Is he, is he not a, a victim? There's that word again, of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction happiness out of this world if he only manages well. So we have this delusion, this insanity. If we only manage well, we'll have happiness. You know, we're always looking for happiness where outside myself. I'm going to have money. I got to have this. I got to have that. And we follow the pecking order. And my instincts are misdirected and my materials misdirected. I'm always going to be looking for out here. Security is within me. But we believe, you know, we have happiness if we get our life back, to, you know, together out here. And when we're, that's a condition of being driven by instincts. We're always seeking out here to satisfy that. So the pursuit to, to fulfill and satisfy our instincts is that's what we do. We chase it outside ourselves. Personal relations, pocketbook, sex, whatever it is, we can go on. Where's God? Great reality within us. And the difference between instincts and God is God gives us harmony and satisfaction internally. So we can so we can bring that from from in here to you out here not me trying to get this out here and bring it into me you know rather than trying to you know find harmony you know in the world and you know one is the great reality and one is a false reality that we you know this is the great thing about the steps we can get caught up in that false reality and go back and do more inventory always that's the beauty of this they always recreate see so also as it says is it not evident to the rest of the, of the players that, that these are the things he wants. You know, like he's saying, you know, don't they know what I want? He's, he's mad. Don't you know who I am? You know, because he's not getting what he wants. Then look at this. And do not his axes make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show. So he resents another, takes action, and then harms him. They come back and beat him up or retaliate or harm him back. And now he's resenting them for something he started. That's instincts and collision. Let's go to page 80 of the 12 and 12. It's going to have a really perfect example of instincts and collision. So. If you hear pounding in my house, it's not so I'm trapped in my basement. It's my son getting mad at the video game. <laughs> Um, 
So page eight of the twelve, uh, page eight of the twelve and twelve, the bottom of it says, "We we might ask next, might ask ourselves what we mean when we say we have harmed other people. What kinds of harms do we do to people to do one another anyway?" To define the word harm in a practical way, we might call it result of instincts and collision, which cause physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual damage to people. I love the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual damage to people, right? If our tempers are constantly bad, we arouse anger in others. If we lie or cheat, we deprive others not only of their worldly goods, but of their emotional security and peace of mind we really issue them an invitation to become contentious and vengeful if our sex conduct we know about that is selfish we may excite jealousy misery and a strong desire to retaliate in kind so perfect example the instincts and collision is just like two rams two stubborn rams banging heads who's gonna win there's there's nothing in that you know you know how how does our actor, you know, end up when he's driven by these instincts? Is, his, is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? That's how he winds up. Even in his greatest moments, he's a producer of confusion rather than harmony. In his best moments, more confusion than peace. Um, I'm going to go, let's jump to 73 real quick, and we're going to cover this again, but... I always like to follow where he mentions the actor um, again, just to kind of tie it together. It's more about this guy a little bit here. So go to 73 and says, um, where it says more. More than, than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He is very much the actor. I like what he calls it a, a double life. You know, some of us had more than a double life. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. That's, you know, like it says here, this is the one he likes his fellows to see. But usually we're trying, when we have a, a stage character, we're doing it to fit something to, like, if I'm hanging out with Howard or something like that, or, you know, he might be into the Almond Brothers, so I'm going to show up at his house and I'm going to say, hey, even though I like the Almond Brothers, um, I, I might just want to like i got to hustle towards him so i'm going to say i'm going to go i love that band even if i don't you know i i want to have a stage character i'm going to present i'm going to go hang out i used to sell um uh drugs and i would go to the rich areas and i would put on a polo shirt and go sell uh, i'll say it, cocaine to the rich kids because i wanted to fit that stage character and but I, there wasn't me at all you know i had a stage character to the outer world, he brings a stage character. This is the one he wants his fellows to see. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation. But look at this. He knows in his heart he doesn't deserve it. That's the thing. And when you sit down and do this inventory process, that that thing you knew in your heart you doesn't deserve it, you're pushing it out. You're letting it come out. So you're, you know, the, let's see what it says here. The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. Coming to his senses, he's revolted at a certain episode he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. And, and what does he do with them? He trembles to think someone might have observed him. Look at, look at this. As, as fast as he can, what, what does he do with it? He shoves these memories far inside himself. He hopes they'll never see the light of day. He is under constant fear and tension that makes for more drinking. Like again, where's God? within us and we're shoving all these negative ne negative emotions it's like we have this beautiful inner temple that's been there our whole lives and we've been storing all our bad stuff all our bad memories and frustrations and resentments in that temple you know um that's why in our best moments we're producing confusion rather than harmony because harmony is blocked it's it's blocked it's a false sense of it. Let's go back to 61, a little bit more about our actor. Where it says our actor is self-centered. We'll get into that word in a minute. Egocentric. There's the ego involved now. I think I'm separated from everybody else. I'm separated from you, and I'm better than you. 
as people like to call it nowadays. He is like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in, in, the, um, in, in the winter complaining over the sad state of the nation. The minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century, politicians and reformers who were sure all would be utopia. If the rest of the world would only behave, we hear that today, right? The outlaw safecracker who thinks that Sai has wronged him. And the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. Look at this right here. Look at this la look at this question. Whatever our prostations, right? You know, another word for you know, you could say disclosures or whatever, but whatever our prostations are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentment, or our self-pity. At the end of the day, when driven by misdirected instincts, we are concerned with our, our ourselves, our resentments, and our self-pity. Hmm. Now we get to the good stuff. This is all good stuff. Don't get me wrong. Selfish and self-centered that we think is the root of our troubles. So let's look at these words really quick. Selfish, I mentioned a minute ago, and it's, it's you know, self, self-centered. So I look at them as the same thing. I mean, it's, you know, it, you know, selfishness is tending mostly to my own needs with another thought of others. And same thing, self-centeredness is concerned primary with my own needs and needs and wants and well-being and all that just about me. So selfish is something you will never be fully aware of understand until you do 49 especially somewhere with in your you might you know people might check it off in step four but when it comes down to significant you know former wives or husbands and stuff they won't check that box that's where the fifth step comes in <laughs> it's it's you know it's time to turn your our thinking and our actions over to something other than yourself. Stop making decisions based on other people. So it says the root of our troubles. The root is the source and it's the origin of something. It's the cause of something, and it comes from a, a Latin word which means starting point. The starting point is where something begins, right? The starting point is where you know whether that's it's. You know, it's the root of a tree or the root of a problem. So we're going to look at it like this. I'm going to share the screen. The greatest picture. I need to re replace that picture. We see a nice tree. You know, that's only what we see on the surface, but it's what's under the tree that tells a story, right? Right? And your first thing you noticed is the roots are what? Way bigger than the tree. Now let's look at it from an entirely different perspective, right? A tree, you know, is what everyone sees on the surface, right? And so we walk into AA and we're alcoholics, right? And people look at us and they see alcoholic or addict, right? But the truth is, alcohol is just, is alcohol is just a symptom. A symptom is a, is an indicator of a, of a disease or disorder. Again, it's what's underneath that tells the story, right? This is the root of the troubles. You know, we decide to eliminate alcohol from our lives. And I go to AA and I eliminate alcohol and I'm stuck with this. Now I can sit in my ass at meetings and it's beyond this and hope this this all this stuff goes away. Do you see the problem? Is we get sober, we go to AA or what CA or wherever else we go. But but all we did was eliminate the symptom. We cut down the tree. The roots are still there. Right? And take a minute, you know, to, to look at the misery and chaos. You know, I, I put all the instincts in the middle here, but look at the all you know, fear, personal relations, but all the crazy stuff's all here. Even the restless irritableness, can even obsessions in there. Selfishness, self-seeking, frightened, resentment, pride, inconsiderate, jealousy. I mean, there's way more to put in there too. Misery. Right. You see what you know what the instincts create, you know. Problem is self. Security, social, security, sex, and each one's 
you know, lonely, harms, rage. You know, if if you if you don't eliminate the root, they grow back. If you don't limit the root, it always grows back. If my I had a a gardener here at my house one time because I can't do yard work because my back, and so I had I kind of went through it finding a good gardener, and every year this guy would just weed whack the weeds and they grow back and i didn't want weeds and i had to explain to him i go can you just get to the root of them you know that's what happens if we, if we just cock off the, the the you know we need to get to the root my dad used to make me do i hated that when i was a kid my dad would say get down and you give me that it looks like a spear to dig out the, the you know the roots of the weeds and i was like i think he grew it on purpose <laughs> so it's like but i had to get rid of the roots you know but let's you know let's look at this one more time you know, and, you know, there's no other way to eliminate this stuff. And see what happens is if you don't eliminate the roots, the tree grows back. And it might not grow back perfectly, you know, oops. But that's what that's all about. It's all about this right here. We can sit in this and live in this and pretend it's not there. This is the elephant in the room. This is why I'm doing these, this stuff. So let's see what the book says. Driven by hundred forms of fear, self delusion self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Instincts in collision again. Someone's, you know, driven by hundred forms of fear, not one fear, hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, you know. Fear is just, you know, that's the basic survival mechanism. But when left unattended, what happens? Can lead to unpleasant feelings of anxiety, tension, distress. I Meaning if you sit on fear, that's where it ends up. And we're driven by a hundred forms of self-delusion. And that's this insane, erroneous belief that is held despite evidence to the contrary. You know, believing that something isn't true. Complete illusion. Anything that's diluted is absolutely insane. We're driven by a hundred forms of, of self-seeking, right? Pursuing my own interest. It's a hundred forms of harm, you could say. We're driven by a hundred forms of self-pity. That's the re, you know, that's resenting ourselves. And we hold that deep. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Would you say there's a pretty good chance that we may you know, stepping on toes of our fellows that we may have harmed other people. Why would I want to, you know, if I'm stepping on toes of other people, they retaliate back and forth. Why would I want to do a harm inventory? How many toes have you stepped on? See what it says here, back to this book. Okay. Sometimes they hurt us, but seemingly without provocation, we, but we invariably found that sometime in the past, we made decisions based on self, which is the instincts, pride. We made decisions based on pride. We made decisions based on self-esteem, on pocketbook, sex, which later places the position to be hurt. Think about that. How many times has that happened? So our troubles are basically, basically to think are of our own making. Believe it or not, that's hope right there. You know, because I was convinced my troubles were everyone else's making. And I didn't want to do the steps because of that reason. I wanted, you know, I wanted to be, you know, proved, like Fred says, proved, you know, I'm going to prove to you where you guys have been wrong. But from the steps perspective, it's, it's hope when I finally realized my problems were my own making. They arise out of ourselves and the alcoholics, an extreme case of self-will run riot even those that think so instincts run what what happens if there's a riot you know mayhem destruction violence damage conflict we, we can keep going when something runs riot it means it's out of control think of like they're running to the bulls right it's out of control self will run riot is instincts out of control and don't you think you know you know it's because you're not aware of it, you know, we're blinded by it. That's why we have this beautiful thing called inventory. 
There's a reason for that. Because see what it says, above everything, we alcoholics must rid ourselves of the selfishness. Why do we need to rid myself of selfishness? Well, it's gonna tell us we must, or it kills us. Wait a minute. I mean, I thought booze killed us. That's what they tell me to come in there. You know, we saw from the root boot alcohol that does not kill us at the end of the day. It's selfishness. You people all the time tell newcomers this is a selfish program. And then tell the newcomers, you know, they then we read in the meeting, you know, some guy will say selfishness is, is, is a selfish program. Then all of a sudden we read the meeting, um, so selfishness is the root of our troubles. And the newcomer is sitting there going, what the heck? You know, we, we must be rid of it. And the, the selfish program, you know, it, it's, if practice, you know, it's not a selfish program. This, if practice is a way of life, this program brings change to the very core of our being. We'll, we'll move from being selfish, self-centered to God-centered, or as people, other people call other-centered, right? So selfish to selfless, you know, fear to peace of mind. Get rid of that self-delusion and have um, wholeness, complete, you know, soundness of mind. Go from calm, from you know, from harming others, self-seeking to calmness, to from resenting yourself and self-pity to, to compassion. So we discovered, you know, the freedom to love God, you know, and one another. And most important, we find the freedom to love ourselves. You know, and that's a complete spiritual basis of, for living right there. We can go, we, we, we go from caring only about ourselves to love and service of others. Our day begins, how may I serve thee? You know, what service can I do? It's just amazing. You know, my instincts out of control. I'm selfish. I chase after money, sex, friends. Because of that selfishness, when we attempt to achieve happiness on our own, outside of us, you know, we never get it. When we seek happiness away, you know, we, happiness f f f with God, happiness, you know, is there. If so, what happens if I rid myself of selfishness and put God first? We find happiness. So never under, under, underestimate that. You know, it says God makes that possible. And there obviously needs to be no way of completely getting rid of self instincts without his aid, getting rid of pride without his aid. You know, there's that word again, completely, entirely, right? And pay attention to that in this book, right? We, you know, we heard that before in entire psychic, not just a psychic change, entire psychic change, complete psychic change. Rigorous honesty, complete honesty, not just honesty. Complete also means what? Wholeness. Only the steps can bring us to there. To the deepness we need to go to as alcoholics. So what they're saying, that there is no way of complete honesty without getting rid of self. And we need God to do that without his aid. So we might be able to get rid of some self on our own or 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 am i just fulfilling my instincts right i make enough money but it only lasts a little bit but you know to completely get rid of self we need god and the truth is this i mean all the joy you ever experience is when you are not relying on self all the pain you will experience is when you're trying to rely on self so if you if you get completely rid of self, what state will you be in? Joy, complete state of joy. I mean, what are the steps about? Are they a method to, you know, keep us sober? A method to remove alcohol? I mean, to, to be rid of alcoholism? No, that's just a byproduct of it. They are a method to completely be rid of self. We must die of self. And it's by dying we we are born to internal life. 
think I'll say, look, look at this here. Many of us had made moral philosophical convictions galore. You can make a list of that, right? But we cannot live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Now we could reduce ourselves, reduce our self centers by much or by wishing or trying our own power. We had to have God's help. It's a great story that I tell us every time we're here at this spot. There's this, there's um, this old lion. He's kind of like the you know the Lion King lion, the old one. And he's cruising up around the around the countryside, looking for some food. And he sees a bunch of sheep, and he you know he's past his prime. This lion, he ain't what he used to be. And he sees the sheep, so he goes, I'm going to sneak up on him. And he trips over an old tree stump and scares all the sheep away. They all run away except for one. But it's a lion. And the old lion goes, what are you sitting there hanging out with all these sheep? And he goes, Mr. Lion. And the other lion, the, 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 the sheep lion goes, bah. And, he goes, and the old lion goes, what? And the sheep lion goes, bah. And the old lion's like putting his head in his head. And he goes, you mean to tell me you think you're, he goes, well, he goes, you're a sheep? And the lion just goes, bah. And he goes, follow me. And he takes the sheep lion down to a crystal clear lake. And the old lion looks into the water. And he asks the sheep lion, what do you see? And he goes, I see you. And he goes, what am I? He goes, I am a lion. He goes, you are a lion. He goes, now you look into the water. And the sheep lion looks into the water and he jumps back. And he goes, what do you see? He goes, I saw you. And he goes, look closely. And he stares at his reflection in the lake. His posture changes. He makes this roar out. He says, I'm the king of the beast. And he runs off. Now, physically, did anything about that lion change? But inwardly, everything changed in a matter of seconds. And by everything changing within him, changed the very core of his being and became aware of what he truly was. And that's what happens to us. Physically, we don't change a whole lot. Inside, you know, inwardly reorganized. Look what it says here. This is the how and why, but first of all, we had to quit playing God. It doesn't work. So now we're getting the high self-esteem thing. Playing God is this, you know, behaving the selfish, egotistical, ego manner of imposing my what my superiority on you uh, by controlling you, and and not just controlling others, but situations. Have you done that? You know, trying to arrange things to suit yourself, controlling things. So, so next, we decided here out in this drama of life, God was going to be the director. So. Now we got God as a director, you know, a director, you know, his duty is again to manage things. You know, who's been your director? Let's go to page 68 really quick. All right, where it says, perhaps there's a better way. We think so. We're now on a, on a, we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite self. So that means we trust unlimited God rather than unlimited self. We're in the role, is what underline this, we are in the world to play the role he assigns. So maybe we're still an actor, so to speak. But now, God is the director. You can't serve two masters. Right? You cannot be directed by misdirected instincts, which is ourself, and be directed by God at the same time. You can't be God-reliant and dishonest at the same time. You can't be happy and be resentful at the same time. Look what it says next. He is the principle. Back, back to where we were at, 62. He is the principle. And we are his agents. So I think the principle is God's will, thinking, right? The, but, but, but first of all, we didn't like that guy, did we, growing up? The principle, right? That guy that walked, you know, the high authority person that said, hey, you know, 
Mr. Rob, you can't be smoking that behind the building there. <laughs> you know? He is he, he was the highest authority, the most important position or rank, that type of person, right? And an agent, though, is an individual that what represents a person or group, right? So if we're now working for God, we're agents of God, right? If I'm an agent of God, how well have I represented the company? How well have I represented the company in the past if I'm an agent of God? How well have I represent the company now that I'm an agent of God? How well have I represented the company? How well, right, very second, how well am I representing God? He is the father and we are his children. Now we get into love, unconditional love. If something's unconditional, it's absolute. Not subject to conditions. The unconditional love is, is a love that's absolute. A love that is not subject to, to any conditions. It's beyond words. It's beyond limitations of our minds. It's loving all. And a lot of people call it agape love. The type of love that not based on a person's worthiness to be loved. We just love them. But most of all, it's a healing love. And if it's a healing love, we can affect everyone we encounter. Especially when we bring the message. So when we strip away all the BS and drop the front we want others to see and remove the mask we wear, we discover that love is all we really are. It's inside of you. It's been waiting to come out. And it's a, love is just a state of being. It allows you to shift from what's in it for me, my ego, to selfless and embrace others. So it flows through me into the world. It creates the aura we want people to see without trying to create the aura ourselves. And it affects every single person we encounter. So if you love all and have no enemies, think about that. If you love all, you have no enemies. I'm not a biblical scholar or anything like that, but there's a line in the Bible where a guy says, if you say you love God, uh, um, and I'm sorry, if you say you love God and have enemies, I call you a liar. You say you love God and have enemies, I call you a liar. So actually, if you say you love Jesus and have enemies, I call you a liar. Love all, no matter what. That's my motto. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was a keystone of a new and triumphant arch, which we pass. Look at this word, freedom. This book, we're building an, a spiritual structure all the way through it. Bill made numerous references to the structure. I'm going to put up the slide again, of course. Oops, let me get to where I want to be. So, in step one, we talked of this, of the foundation. And a foundation is the most essential part of a building. We've explained it before. It's the base, you know, the entire building stands on is to hold the building together. The walls, the roof, it supports the weight of the building. It anchors it together. A foundation is built to last how long? Forever. Even longer than the house. Because when the house falls down, what's still there? The foundation, right? So it's very important to pay attention to every little detail that goes into the foundation. In essence, it will remain always intact. The reason step one is the foundation is because step one is the only step I do 100%. 100% convince your powers of alcohol. No lurking notions. No one day I'm going to be immune or get blessed and it's all going to go away. That's why step one is the most important step. The willingness foundation, the ready foundation. Am I ready to do this? You're not going to do this. You're not going to make your powers until you make your ready. I'm sorry, you're not going to admit your powerless until, you, until you're ready, so I meant to say. Until you're ready. I just get mad when people didn't want to do four steps with me, and my sponsors go, you're just not ready. Let's look at, so we get the cornerstone. Step two. The first stone laid at the corner of the building, where two walls begin, and it's just going to tie this foundation together, start where everything's going to start depending on it. Our cornerstone is believing or willing to believe in a power greater than ourselves. You know, remember what it says in there. It's been repeatedly, pro re repeatedly proven among us that a simple cornerstone, a wonderful spiritual structure can be built upon, right? Now it tells us the spiritual structure 
what it's called. It's called an arch. So this arch is a curved structure that forms a passageway or an entrance to spawning an opening. It kind of resembles an upside down U, I guess you could say. But it's a, it's a series of wedge-shaped blocks. And those blocks are and arches are called versuers, vow squares. And those blocks, they're cut precisely, almost like you put your knuckles together. If you put them together, they can't move up and down. They would cut them that way so they fit like a puzzle together. And so they're the, so the neighboring blocks couldn't move or go slide out. And the central of the square at the summit is called the keystone, and which is step three. And the keystone is the heaviest stone. You, so and back in the way, early days, they made them out of marble or even a heavier stone than a marble. Probably marble was what they used. And they would build up the sides and they would drop it down until it just sunk even the foundation into the ground. Um, if you remove that cornerstone, I mean keystone, what happens? It falls. It, it, it falls over. It all falls down. They, as you can see, you know the other stones that were squares. You know, more will be revealed as we go through this book. This is not the last yeah. time we're going to see this, especially especially when we get to that. The more you know, stronger it gets, the more spiritual life it has, and you, know, you start to see. The new trap and arts, which we pass to freedom, right? Freedom is is the capacity to live life without restraints, no restrictions, no you know you're living life. Freedom is is where you're where the 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 window of your car is the big. It, it, it's like being in your car and realize that the front windows is, is what's in front of you is big, and the rearview mirror is just this little tiny thing in the past. You start seeing, and you gain more freedom. You start seeing the whole world as it is, you know. Um, but that's the thing that is, you know, it's live life without, it's limitless life, infinite. Do you want freedom from self? That's the question you want to ask yourself. Do I want freedom from self? You know, this is about demolishing of self. Many seekers have this falsehood that freedom is about waiting until their resentments and, and guilt and fear somehow, you know, melt away from them on their own power, disappear. You get a lot of guys in this program and women that will say, I don't have resentments anymore. I just, you know, I just, I, I don't embrace them anymore. But you can tell me what they are, right? You know? Is at that point where we realize, you know, we must take action to be free. We realize that, that it's, this is not a game. We must eliminate the old ideas that have driven us by seeking the power that is within us. And what happens? The reward is restored to sanity. So I must tear down these walls that I built block by block. And those, those walls do not come down without effort. So I must tear down each and examine each piece of, of my life, each, you know, brick by brick, each little piece. So I can know what those are, those bricks are built out of in the walls. Perhaps maybe it's those bricks are the very ones we build the arch with. Who knows? But self-examination is the key. Self-inventory is the key. So we can be free our minds from what blocks us. So we can, you know, so we can let things go and make and, and go and, and make right for the past. And what happens is you will discover something called the world of the spirit. And you'll discover something in the world of the spirit. There is no laws. I, um, my old pal uh, Sandy Beach used to say, You can anyone can enter the world of the spirit, you just have to leave your crap at the door. You can't take your crap into you at the world of the spirit. I love that. Um, there's a, a Greek motto I have on my wall that that I love, know thyself. You know, make that the goal of your life so you can find the freedom you're looking for, you pray for. You know, there, there's two roads to freedom. And, so, and it sums up the fellowship in a whole so much. The first one is an easier road. 
what's the reward of something being easier? It's easier. The second road is a harder, rougher road where the result, the reward is freedom. So do you want a reward of something just being easier or do you want a road of freedom? It's a little bit of a harder road. And, you know, the first step on that road to freedom is coming to, to the awareness that the same mind that is the problem will never solve it. Reading self-will can overcome self-will. I guess I'm just saying a spiritual transformation has to occur if you want long-term in this. There's many roads to self, hundreds, thousands, but fewer roads to freedom. Many roads to self, many, many, many. But you'll find out in those fewer roads to freedom, your life changes forever. And you, you know, when you discover this truth, and the truth is that nothing is more important in life except to be free. And you know, how free do you want to be? And you discover, well, what gets me free? The steps. So nothing more important in life for me has to be the steps. Because because that leads to freedom. So next week, we're going to talk about how we make a decision to seek that freedom. I'm going to stop the recording. Hopefully I don't turn everything off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs>